This is Vanessa Marshall, Harrison Dula from Star Wars Rebels, and you're listening to Coffee with Kenobi. Hey, where do you think you're all going? Get back inside. You're not a droid. You got me for a bargain. I've taken down so many clones over the years. Once you figure out one, the rest are easy. You're in for a surprise. Besides, it is most unlikely that the Marauder will be recovered. What? Don't say that! We have to get it back! We can always acquire another ship. You speak to me with respect. In my experience, respect is something to be earned. Yet, the Empire assigned you to this desolate rock, where you let the majority of your squad get killed. Tell me, Lieutenant, how many missions have you commanded? This is James Arnold Taylor, and you're listening to Coffee with Kenobi. Hmm, I have a good feeling about this. Hello, friends, and welcome to Coffee with Kenobi. I am your host, Dan Zare, delighted to talk Star Wars with you. Ever since May of 2013, I want to help provide a positive family-friendly, spoiler-free place to discuss this galaxy far, far away. Imagine walking into your favorite coffee shop and hearing a discussion of Star Wars films, Disney Plus live action, animation, books, comics, collectibles, or Star Wars experiences at the Disney theme parks. I want to share that experience here on this podcast, weekly interactive live video every Tuesday night, my website, special events, email newsletter, and more. Find out more and join our Star Wars community at www.coffeewithkenobi.com. Thank you to the official travel partner of Coffee with Kenobi, MEI, and Mouse Fan Travel. Check out coffeewithkenobi.com slash mousefantravel for a no-cost, no-obligation quote, and let them know Coffee with Kenobi and Dan Zare sent you. On today's very special show, I have the privilege of joining the Bad Batch Season 3 Virtual Press Junket along with many of my esteemed peers and honored to be with all of them. I got to speak with Jennifer Corbett, the head writer and executive producer of The Bad Batch, Brad Rao, supervising director and executive producer of The Bad Batch as well, and then, of course, Michelle Ang, the voice of Omega. So pull up a chair, grab your favorite coffee mug, and let's have some coffee with Kenobi as we celebrate the beginning of Season 3 of The Bad Batch. Hi, this is Trisha from Fangirls Going Rogue. Um, Omega has this incredible ability to hope for the best from people or situations. What do you think the audience can learn from her optimism? Um, You know, that optimism can get you through the face of some really challenging times. Um, Season three is a really... Is a, is a big one for Omega. She suddenly is hit with the realization that her, that she might be the cause for uh, why the Bad Batch is constantly in peril and that weighs pretty heavy. <laughs> um, so I think, yeah, that that this, no matter how bleak the circumstances, if you can find a way to to have hope, then, uh, then that can sustain you through some dark times. Sorry about that. Our next one is going to be Dan from Coffee with Kenobi. Thank you. Dan. Oh yes, thank you so much. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to speak with you. Omega is an is a total beacon of joy and hope for so many of us, and I want to thank you for that. Now, when you think about her journey, especially in this season, what do you think the most important thing for her to learn has been as her character in the series has progressed? Um. It's kind of, oh, it's tricky, lots of things, but like for this season, I would say sort of self-confidence. Season two was so much about like learning skills from all of the different brothers, but now there's a big chunk of the season where she's literally alone or at least separated from most of most of the people she's relied on in the past. So it's this self-reliance that brings about a self-confidence that kind of sees her through the season. Thank you, Dan. Our next one is Mark coming from Fanta Treks. 
Hi, hello. Um, Omega's grown a lot, but how has she changed for you in the time that you've played her? How has she changed for me? You mean as like how my relationship to her or like in a more physical portrayal kind of Yeah. You, you started off with the kids. You've got now a much more mature, you know, weathered. She's learned a lot and grown a lot. How, so how has that changed for you in yeah, in terms of the performance? Yeah. And you know what? The, the writers have done a beautiful job of of keeping the growth, at, you know, consistent. Um, so really, for me, my job's so easy because these scripts come fully formed and and because we are shooting them chronologically, which sometimes doesn't happen when you're doing live action, uh, I'm building off of the last episode that I've dropped anyway. So my knowledge is up to date with Omegas and I just rely on the, yeah, the sort of detail in the script. Um, yeah, if that makes sense. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Our next one is Keith and Kerwin. Hi there. Hi, this is Keith and Kerwin from Father Sun Galaxy. Mm -hmm. Hey guys, nice to see you again. Good nice to see, see you again too. So the series has allowed Omega to develop relationships with all of her brothers. What has she learned from each one? From each one? Um, I mean, I feel like, you know, primarily it was with Hunter and then you know, then in season two, there was a we got to explore a lot with tech rip uh and echo and sort of you know the the practical side of like having knowledge and and fixing things and then echo sort of the principled nature of knowing what his mission is in terms of which omega has adopted as well which is like there are our brothers who need us who are being taken away and tested on and in peril and it's our duty to 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 you know and we should be in service of trying to help them um and then this last season is, you know, I'm so excited that Omega is reunited with Crosshair because she challenges him. And in some ways, I think Crosshair has something to learn from her <laughs> in this season. Um, and their roles are reversed in some ways. I, Omega becomes a caretaker and someone with wisdom, both to Crosshair as an individual with what he's going through with his sort of trauma and PTSD and also the reintegration of like um, relationships after a fracture, you know, bringing crosshair back in and, and what forgiveness uh, and, and real love in the face of, you know, in the face of a betrayal and then reuniting together what that can look like. Thank you guys. Our next one is William from I Am Canon. Hi, William. Hi, sorry. Oh, no. Sorry. Uh, sorry about that. The computer locked up. <laughs> I'm good now. Uh, William Devereaux with Ion Cannon. Uh, actually, playing off of that last question, Omega has such a great relationship with each member of the Bad Batch. Uh, and the dynamic with each one is so different. Which is your favorite member of the Bad Batch to play off of? I feel like across the seasons it's changed because, you know, there has been stronger relationships. But e this is an easy question to answer for me at this juncture because season three, it's it's just so f delicious, this new dynamic between Crosshair and Omega. And, uh, you know, because Crosshair is getting as good as he gives, you know, there are some juicy moments where she really gets to be like, listen, guy. <laughs> This, stop stop being stop being like this you this is how you do it and she gets to prove crosshair wrong and there's a sort of like beautiful funny bickering that underneath it all has so much love which is at least in my experience so indicative of what family actually is like the ability to confront and hold accountable and tease and still have it come from a place of of generosity and ultimately love Thank you so much, William. Uh, Sarah and Richard, are you guys are next. Hey, hey, this is Sarah and Richard from Skywalking Through Neverland. It, it is. Hey there. It's so much fun watching scenes between Omega and Batcher. Do you get to record <laughs> scenes with Dee Bradley Baker as he's performing Batcher? And how much fun is that? 
I mean, this is wild and obviously well known at this point. Uh, Dee is just such a vocal magician and he absolutely leapt at the chance to play Batcha. And, you know, with Dee, there's never any, I would be reading the script and there, there are moments where it calls for Batcha to be expressive and it would just be this like long sort of diatribe of moment. And I'd be like, is that, nope, nope, let's go. Okay, well, it's, it's D just brings so much color to it, which was really essential being that you're right, Omega has this deep connection to a non-speaking character. Um, but yeah, watching D utilize that amazing skill of his is never ever gonna bore me. It's just incredible. <laughs> Thank you so much. Alex, you are next from Star Wars. Hi, this is Alex from Star Wars Explained. Uh, one of my favorite, hi, one of my favorite Omega character traits is how she will mimic the mannerisms of the people that she looks up to, like Hunter or Fee. Uh, if you could pick any Star Wars character for her to, for her to hang out with and mimic, who would you like to see? Hmm. Mm, any Star Wars character? Well, I mean, so tricky. I don't know. All I can say is, I don't know if you guys have seen up to this part, but like, Asajj Ventress was a real, it was incredibly interesting to Omega. Like, like, you know, she's come across formidable uh, female figures, but uh, I think that one in particular really sort of took Omega, a, yeah, it took Omega, she had to take a step back and sort of there was this sort of fear and respect and like intrigue. Um, so maybe her. <laughs> Thank you so much, Alex. Our next one is George. Um, over the course of three seasons, Omega has kind of won everyone's Parts over. There's some beautiful moments, some intimate ones, some epic ones. I'm wondering if there's a particular Omega moment or even episode that really stands out to you across your three seasons of work. Mm. Oh my gosh, that stands out to me. It spans so much, so so much time, and my memory is so bad. But uh, like, I guess, oh. I mean. I know you guys haven't seen the finale of season three yet and there were slightly different ways we you know we weren't set on exactly how it was going to end so there were sort of some explorations um but like as a as a actor and as like an emotional sort of moment I'd have to say that I know that's such a mean answer because you haven't seen it but just I feel like it was it's like the culmination of my journey as a performer and Omega's journey as a character, like all consolidated into like two lines <laughs> or something, you know? Yeah. Thank you, George. Our next one is Caitlin. Hi, I'm Caitlin from Sky Talkers. So nice to talk to you today, Michelle. Um, my hey. question is. Last season, we saw Omega witness the Senate hearings where they discussed the future of the clones. And now she's seeing what's happening to them at Mount Tantus. How do you think experiences like these are changing Omega as she's growing up and her understanding of the galaxy? Well, you know, the, the whole concept to her that there is there are differences between rights of living beings just blew her mind. You know, like some people have rights, some people have, have, you know, the ability to be represented. And then there's this whole community of who she considers her brothers and now sister who, who don't. And so that inequity, I think at first was like sort of mind blowing, but you're at Mount Tantus, it's really dark. Like these, the, the things that are going on there are very, without even having that knowledge of, of politics or whatever just on a on a hum, humane level she's like this is deeply unsettling um so sorry what the, what was the part the second part of your question oh just how it's influencing her and her thoughts on the galaxy and growing up yeah I mean I think this is where the complexity of like 
the fact that she's still a child, but then knowing that things are wrong sort of come into play. Like, I don't think she's worried about fixing the whole galaxy, but what she does feel very strongly about is this facility is, is doing things to people that, 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 I care about and we need to get them all out. So that becomes like a very, very forceful drive throughout season three, which is that not only does she want to extricate both herself and Crosshair, but there's this desire to that is not accomplished until she's managed to take out all the clones from Mount Tantus. Thank you, Caitlin. Our next one is Tara. Hi, Michelle. This is Tara Bennett from Star Wars Insider Magazine. Um, I wanted to circle back to the question before last, just in terms of talking about the end of the season. Um, it's really special, you know, that uh, you got a chance to complete the arc of, of your character in the series. And um, uh, without spoilers, but just in terms of your own of your own experience with it, did you treat that final um, script in a different way? Was it... Um, did you want to know what was coming? Um, did you want to be go pure when you went, when you went into it? I know you said that there were still some changes, but you know, at the end of the day, it's the last time, um, maybe you know that you'll play her. Um, so it's just interesting to see how you you kind of treated it, and then you know if it, you wanted to be surprised as you read it. I mean, I knew it was obviously we knew this was the, going to be the final um, season, and it was with great trepidation when I received the last script that I opened it up. And you know, I will admit, I, it wasn't like I was reading it while I was eating lunch. Like I had to prepare myself emotionally before opening up the document because, yeah, it is. It's it is really sentimental, and and I was I was sad. Uh, you know, I'm grateful for the journey, but the fact that it had to end after three was, you know was surprising and, and shocking but also I think that the writers have done a beautiful job um I yeah I I I, I don't know how to say it with it's so hard to say it without giving spoilers I, I think that the the gravity of the final sort of moments <clears throat> made it easy to feel like that was the culmination of everything like the I was excited um in one in one sort of exploration because uh Omega was sort of set up uh with the possibility of a very large future perhaps and then um and then it changed from there so then I had to park that um, expectation about where Omega would end up to one side and go with the new idea, um, which was a little bit bittersweet. Uh, but I, I also was able to see some of the previs uh, because the because the last two episodes took a little bit longer to put together, and that was actually really awesome to see the visualization of those final moments, and that yeah, that sort of brought the whole experience together for me. Thank you. Thank you, Tara. We have one more question for Sarah and Richard. Okay, great. Uh, so basically, Omega is in the first part of the season, you know, she's captive. And before that, she was free with the Bad Batch. Is there anything you did different with like your prep or your voice acting to display those differences? That's actually really insightful as a question because there was this talk about like, like how long has she been in this facility? And, you know, we've all talked about her optimism in the face of, you know, terrible things, but even like the, I, I wanted to make sure it felt real that she was a, a prisoner, you know? And so that kind of the dreariness, the mundaneness, and, you know, she's kept in the cell with like no, nothing stimulating. And it's, she, you know, her closest person that she gets to, converse with is Emery who although she's her sister is like so cold and emotionally withholding um so yeah in terms of performance it's like having a physical toll of mundaneness uh adds a bit of like weight or it does it does change your vocal quality and, and I did think a lot about that um and sometimes, you know, the tension between wanting to re remain optimistic, but like then physically sort of feeling the burden of, you know, being kept or, you know, being in a sterile environment. Um, and I think that that was quite important. Um, I'm glad that you touched on it because 
it's a pretty it's a pretty dark space for a young child to be living in yeah thank you thank you guys we have one more for alex uh, the Kiner's music is always a great highlight of any Star Wars animated series. So how does it feel to have your own musical theme? Is it your ringtone or do you ever listen to it to get through the day? The, you, the Bad Batch theme song, you mean? Uh, or Omega's motif, but either. Ah. Um, I was like, what's Omega's motif? Do I hit Omega's motif? Is there a motif for her that always comes up when she appears? I haven't clued on to that. <laughs> Not every time, but uh, there's definitely some recognizable notes. Ah, I mean, listen, I think the composers of the Bad Batch just are like the secret weapon because I don't get to see that. I get to obviously be there for the vocal performance. And then when I do pickups, I get to see some of the visuals. Um, some of them are fairly early in the stages, but I only get to, to like hear the composition once I view with the public when the series goes live. Um so it always blows my mind how much extra emotional heft. I was like, wow, these composers are making me look good. <laughs> like, um, but I, for me that um, the, I don't know the proper word, but the sound of like when the Bad Batch logo comes out is just, yeah, I have such strong emotional correlation of like feeling absolute gratefulness um, when I hear that because I still can't believe I get to be a part of your family. <laughs> First up, we've got Trisha from Fangirls Going Rogue. Hi, Jennifer and Brad. Um, the Clone War, the Bad Batch, excuse me, is ripe with imagery of water. We have the Camino Planet, season two opened with the Crab Heist. We have the frozen water of the Outpost. We have Pabu. And I seem to see these watery images popping up in season three. Could you talk a little bit about water as a storytelling element in this show? You gotta stay hydrated. <laughs> I mean, uh, we are always just looking for different landscapes uh, for the for the show to take place that is uh, cinematic. But in terms of uh, Pabu in general, I'll say uh, that during the pandemic, when we were making season <laughs> two, I think we were all going a little stir crazy and wanting to go on a vacation. So Pabu was very much our dream come true. And we got very obsessed with the sushi on Pabu and how we can make it as realistic as possible. This is kind of our mission. We're going a little stir crazy. A little, a little crazy. Uh, Dan from Coffee with Kenobi. Hello. I want to thank you both so much for the incredible series that is a Bad Batch season three. is is fabulous what we've seen so far. But before we go forward, I'd like to get your thoughts on the loss of tech, specifically how audiences received it. It was so beautifully done and full of pathos. That must have been very bittersweet and gratifying. It was really hard, um, to be honest. Uh, when we, as we conceived the story, we were coming up with the story for the end of season two. We knew if we're going into Tarkin's home base, if you're going to go into the lion's den, there's going to be a price to pay or it's not realistic. And we didn't do any. We didn't do anything lightly. It, several discussions, so much time went into figuring out how that was gonna go. And you know, Tech, he he did the noble thing. He's he's such he, he he sacrificed himself for the rest of his family. And I'll tell you how many times we've you know read the scripts and shot the scenes, literally hundreds and hundreds of times through editorial and music and working with. D, D and Michelle through that whole that whole moment it's it always choked us up every every single time so it was uh it was a it was a big deal and pretty incredible to see the fan reaction and and the loss of of tech is very much talked about you know throughout season three and very present in the characters and how they're dealing with that hole in their lives And Mark from Santa Tracks. Hi, guys. Um, there's a delicate balance between the characters and the broader galactic story that's going on in season three, indeed, in all the seasons of the show. How do you decide and how do you choose the balance between the two? Because I imagine it's very easy to get caught up in the characters as much as it's very easy to get caught up in this broader history that's being built. 
Well, now that it's the final season, it is that balancing act. And uh, it's how do, how do we make sure that we are focusing mostly on the character's journeys, but also give a uh, fulfilling and, uh, and worthwhile um, mission that they can um, take part in for the end. Do you think Kerwin Father Sun Galaxy a Star Wars podcast? Hi, this is Keith and Kerwin from Father Sun Galaxy. Hello there. Hi. One of our favorite episodes of season two, season two was The Outpost. Can you explain how you developed the story and why you chose a vulture to represent Crosshair as a vicious creature trying to find a way to survive? Well, that, that's one of our favorites too. Um, uh, well, even though Crosshair didn't have many episodes in season two, we wanted the ones that he was in to be very impactful. And he wouldn't have gotten to this point if it weren't for the episode with Commander Cody also in season two. Um, the Vulture, which was also voiced by D. Bradley Baker. Yes. <laughs> yeah, he does everybody. Um, yeah, it was just, again, the Vulture is a survivor and the Vulture is this solitary figure as well. So uh, that imagery was very much intentional and uh a lot went into that story so uh i'm i'm glad that you like it <laughs> yeah that's that's one of our favorite episodes we were really really intentional with how close the vulture is to the camera at what point in the story and how close the vulture was to the ground at what point in the story we actually shot way more footage of the vulture at one point jen said brad i think there's too much vulture in the episode you're right jen you're right so yeah, it's uh, it, it was very symbolic. William Ion Cannon. Yeah, William Devereaux Ion Cannon podcast. The dynamic between Crosshair and Echo is so well written, especially in the first half of season three. There's a lot of heart, despite everything that Crosshair has put them through. How did you approach writing this? Their dynamic between these two characters in in the final season. Well, Crosshair has a lot to make up for, and he has still to go through and process the things that he's done. And it's never easy to admit when you're wrong. And what I love about season three is that we're with him as he's going on this journey and guiding him is Omega, because Omega is the one who can see things very clearly, but also how the squad embraces him or doesn't embrace him initially is very much true to their character and also why they feel this way. Um, but yeah, and, and and that relationship with him and everyone uh, will continue to uh, evolve in the episodes you guys haven't seen yet. So. Yeah, some of my favorite moments in season three are conversations between Omega and Crosshair. It's just wait for it. It's incredible. Sarah, Skywalking Through Neverland. Hey, hey, we are Richard and Sarah from Skywalking Through Neverland, and we want to we wanna tap into this water theme. Mm -hmm. As Omega is held in her room in Mount Tantus, which she's told is not a cell, we see water continuously dripping from the faucet. And that can have so many symbolic meanings, but we'd really like to hear from you and what you guys think it means or wanted it to mean. Hmm. Well, maybe we won't answer 100 percent but it it is very symbolic um and we always wanted this sense of sort of monotony in that episode you don't really know how much time has passed in jen's awesome script when i was talking to saul ruiz who was the episodic director for that episode it was an idea that he came up with with his story team like oh saul incredible because we were trying to find a way you know when do we put in the music when do we not have music and in that little room that she's in it's not technically a prison, but it's a prison. Um, how do we how do we convey that? So when the team, and this is just an example of how we make every episode, we're constantly collaborating with all of our storytellers behind the scenes to get the image on frame, to get the sound just the way it's got to be. And that reverberated all the way, you know, literally all the way through the episode to the end when we were doing the mix at Skywalker Sound with David Collins. And it was uh, Collins, the, the drip, we need like a little bit more reverb. And then he had all of his ideas for when we hear it as well. We talked a lot about that dripping water, actually. Alex, Star Wars Explained. Hi, this is Alex from Star Wars Explained. Uh, Mark already kind of touched on this, but I've been so impressed with how well you've balanced a very focused personal story with the Bad Batch. 
uh, with also the big galactic story of all clone troopers. Is that a story you knew you were going to tackle from the beginning of this series? Or is it something that developed over the full three seasons? We've sort of, uh, at the beginning of season one, it was, yes, this is a story about the Bad Batch, but it's also about the story of um, the the end of uh, the clone trooper program and what that looks like in Star Wars. Because I, as I've said before, I, as a fan, always asked what happened to the clones after the war because I, I don't I we don't, we don't see them later so we wanted to just focus again on leaning into that veteran aspect and what that looks like um and how that also affects the batch because even though they're not with the empire and they're not part of it they are still clones and those are still their brothers so again uh, making it as personal as possible uh for the characters and and for the ones telling the story george star wars holocron George Stars Holocron, thank you so much for speaking with all of us today. Um, yeah, I had a question about the connections that the Bad Batch has to other Star Wars stories and, and broader lore. There's obviously a very intimate story, um, the season involving Omega and Crosshair, but there's also all sorts of other connections and references to um, other Star Wars, corners of the Star Wars galaxy. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how those connections come to be and if it warrants collaborations with filmmakers and other creators beyond the, the core team of the Bad Batch. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, when we early days on all of our episodes, we were always talking to Dave Filoni and he has such great insight and he's a great leader and, and friend and mentor to us. Um, we also have access to the Lucasfilm story group, which will from time to time, you know, give us a note about something based on another show. But we are, it's, it's interesting at this time, the timeline of the Bad Batch, there's not a lot of other shows right exactly happening or other anything happening right at this moment of the Bad Batch. So it gives us a little bit of freedom. But then when we get into something like Mount Tantus, speaking of big, big ideas and, and big lore, it gets really, it gets really tricky. And so we're very careful that our personal character story doesn't step on something or contradict something else that has happened elsewhere. Caitlin Skytalkers. Hi, I'm Caitlin from Sky Talkers. So great to speak with you both today. My question is, was it fun to write Crosshair and Omega's dynamic this season? And how is her relationship with Crosshair different from the rest of the Bad Batch? Uh, uh, yes, I love writing the two of them together because they are the odd couple. Um, he comes off as very negative and she comes off as very positive. So anytime that these two can learn from one another, uh, I'm all for and I think it's also just uh, with everything that Crosshair has been through and feeling like he was used, feeling that he was abandoned to be then paired up with this kid who shows nothing but empathy and never gives up on him. Uh, it's yeah, I, I love I love their dynamic and um, I just love the two of them together. And Dean and Michelle took to that so <laughs> much. They love that dynamic and they they put they pushed it in all the in all the right directions. And I I would say, you know, yeah, everything you're saying, Jen, it's so interesting how they each affected each other, not just Omega affecting Crosshair, but how Crosshair affects Omega is, is pretty fascinating, actually. Kara, Star Wars Insider. Tara, are you there? All right, we'll go back to Trisha. I wanted to talk about Fennec Shand. Was she always in the plan or did you end up in a space and realize that she fit the story you were telling? I'd say a little bit of both because we knew that uh, bounty hunters were a particular part of a, a storyline. And since we had seen Fennec Shand interact with Omega and the Batch in season one, she was a, a natural uh, character to kind of slot in there. And also just uh, that uh, her personality versus uh, Hunter and Wrecker is just something that I'd, I'd pay to see. Um, and uh, again, any chance to work with Ming-Na will take because she's phenomenal. Dan? So obviously we're not going to spoil anything because that would be a big no-no. I want to share also the the appreciation as as my esteemed peers have, have echoed throughout 
the intricate level of detail and storytelling that also makes sure to advance character development in a very profound way. It's, it's quite Shakespearean in a way that I, I really love. And I realize this is not a fair question, but are there certain members of the Bad Batch that speak to you more than others? <laughs> I like that you're framing the who's your favorite one in a different way. <laughs> it's impossible. <laughs> um, I Well, yeah, I, I can appreciate Hunter quite a bit because... Um, he's the leader of the squad, but he carries a lot of weight on his shoulders and he's not always the most vocal, but he's trying to keep the family together and, uh, kind of see what, like everything that weighs on him, especially in the beginning of season three with the loss of tech with Omega missing. Um, I, it's just, it's, it's a, it's someone I understand because I would say if that were my kid, I would do this. So I I'm on board with the decision that Hunter's making. Yeah, I mean, I'll just add, you know, I mean, this, the Bad Batch has the Space Dads and Omega as a father myself. There's a lot of times where it's interesting how different members of the Bad Batch react to Omega that are coming right from my heart, coming from our heart as, you know, as creators behind the scenes relating to things that, you know, that we encounter in our own lives. Yeah, there's nothing like, and Hunter's the classic dad, but you know, speaking, we've been talking about Crosshair and Omega. There's a couple of moments where the dad side of Crosshair is quite interesting. It's uh, it's pretty cool. Keith and Kerwin? Yeah, I wanted to talk about tech again. Uh, so how long did it take for you to decide that it was going to be tech that was going to execute Plan 99? I don't know about how long it was convincing ourselves that it had to happen um because we love him so much uh but it in thinking about it and thinking about the squad dynamics tech is very much what i call like the squad navigator and when you take him out of the equation that affects everyone in the squad he would always keep everybody moving be very factual about what they needed to do and you take that out and now everything kind of unravels. So now not only do they not have tech, they don't have Omega and Echo is, you know, off on another mission with Rex trying to uncover other information. So it's really the effect of the squad is them being fractured at the beginning of season three. And we deal with that emotional fallout throughout the season that, that we're missing our brother and our our teammate and our crew our crew member and it affected us behind the scenes the whole time even you know just adding piggybacking off what you're saying jen there were times when there was a moment that you know check could have been really useful in getting out of this jam so we had to solve the problem in a in a different way it uh it, it he he was a huge huge, huge character and his loss is not lost on us that's for sure mark uh, the show's ending. Uh, it's as slick and smooth and confident as any Star Wars show has ever been. So how does it feel to you as people behind the scenes to end the show when you're in such a rich vein of form? Well, oh, thanks a lot. That's awesome compliment. I mean, we've had such a blast. Jen and I were honoured and, you know, we're proud to be able to represent the literally hundreds of people that have been working on this show at Lucasfilm and CGCG and Skywalker Sound and Team Kiner with the amazing music. Our entire cast is beautiful. Um, we all, Sometimes we say behind the scenes, even though it's hundreds of people, it's like we all became this weird bad batch behind behind the scenes as, as well. And so to end the story is certainly bittersweet, but we're really proud that we were able to do it on our terms when we knew this is going to be our, our final season. We were able to land it the way we want it to so we hope you all and all the fans like it as much as we do i'll say as as a storyteller you always have a vision of what a product is going to be and sometimes it doesn't live up to well i that's not really what i what i thought this show has gone above and beyond everything and that is a testament to the cast and and the crew William. Yeah, thank you again for taking the time to talk with us. Omega's high M count, which I think we're all reading through the lines, probably is midi chlorian count, um, uh, implies that she has the force or at least a high affinity for it. 
Uh, of course, in the first two seasons, there have been many moments where she seemed to have either be very talented or have some connection in some way. Uh, of course, you no, know, without spoiling anything, how can how did you approach laying the groundwork for this reveal throughout the previous seasons? Well, I'll say anytime you mention that word, <laughs> I think a lot of people perk up. Um, all we can really say is that I know a lot of you have questions about that and things will be answered, you know, at, through the end of season three. Um, but it is a balance that we're trying to strike because it's, um, we have to be very conscious of, of what we're saying and, and what the things that you're hearing mean. Um, so without spoiling too much, that's, that's an answer or a non-answer. <laughs> yeah, a lot and a lot went into every single time you hear any of those kind of words and what it means and how that comes to be. It took a lot of, a lot of careful planning. This podcast is not endorsed by the Walt Disney Company or Lucasfilm Limited. It is intended for entertainment and informational purposes only. The official Star Wars website can be found at www.starwars.com. Star Wars, all names, sounds, and any other Star Wars related items are registered trademarks and or copyrights of Disney and their respective trademark and copyright holders. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of Coffee with Kenobi unless otherwise indicated. This is the podcast you're looking for. If no one here, Hold on.